You know, in, in, in all my years of preaching, which is a little over 50 years, 47 years of pastoring, um, I have never felt in any country, I've traveled in many countries, I have uh, pastored in three countries, and uh, I've never felt the level of spiritual warfare that is going on now in the world. And uh, I want to look at that with you and talk about it with you for a little while this morning. That uh, I've been, I've been in, in, I mean, all kinds of situations and never felt the level of spiritual warfare. And it's interesting that this past couple of months, I have had probably more people talk to me, pastors, about their churches, people about what they're going through personally, what families are going through than I have probably in the last two years about situations that they're facing. I've seen people make decisions in the past six months that are probably the weirdest decisions I've seen people make in a long time. Seen people move that shouldn't have moved places. People left jobs that shouldn't have left jobs. People spend money that shouldn't have spent money. All kinds of things that people are doing out of context with what they would normally do. And, uh, and you can just look at that and say, well, you know, it's just because of COVID and various things as that. But there is a level of spiritual warfare, and it's a heightened level. And you'll find in the Bible that every time that God was about to usher in something new that he was doing in the world, there would be heightened levels of spiritual warfare. You'll find that when Moses was going to go deliver the children of Israel out of bondage after 400 years, when he got to Pharaoh, there was a heightened level of spiritual warfare. And whenever he would throw his rod down, demons would throw it, the, the, the false uh, uh, people would throw their rods down, they'd become serpents. Everything he did, there was this heightened level of assault against what God wanted to do. You find it in Daniel's time, just a couple of examples. Daniel, at 70 years, when they were in Babylon, captive, Israel was captive for 70 years in Babylon. Whenever it came time for that 70 years to end, Jeremiah had prophesied that Israel would only be in Babylon for 70 years, and then they would be sent back to their land. Looked impossible. How could it be done? Uh, Babylon was not going to let these people go. But at 70 years, Daniel began to pray. And as Daniel began to pray, he was ushering in a new thing God was doing, going to move them back to, uh, to uh, Israel and rebuild the temple. A bunch of things were going to happen supernaturally. And uh, Daniel experienced a heightened level of spiritual warfare. I mean, he was praying for 20-some days, and nothing happened. And when the angel finally came to him, he said, he said that I was sent the very day you started praying, but the prince and the power of Persia, the prince and the power, that's the demonic forces in the principalities, hindered me, and God had to send Michael, the archangel of heaven, to fight for me, to let me come down here and talk to you, Daniel. Spiritual warfare, one of the greatest examples in the Word of God is spiritual warfare. But then when it, the, one of the heightened times was when Jesus Christ came into the world. When Jesus came into the world from the very moment he was born, there was spiritual attacks begin to come. The Bible tells us when he was born that, uh, uh, that, uh, that they killed all the children in that town of Bethlehem where he was at, in that region, because they wanted to kill this baby Jesus that was prophesied was going to be born. But especially 30 years later when Jesus Christ is going to start his ministry. And the Bible tells us uh, that Jesus goes down to get baptized. And as he's getting baptized, the Bible tells us that the heavens opened up, and I'm going to read that scripture to you uh, in, uh, in Luke 3, 21. It says, Jesus also was baptized. While he prayed, the heavens were opened. We're talking about something powerful, folks, when we begin to talk about what God is doing and spiritual warfare. I apologize. That was not working, I don't think, is it? Oh, it is working. Well, thank you, guys. Uh, and uh, uh, 
the heavens were open and the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him and a voice came from heaven and said, you are my beloved son and you I am well pleased. So here Jesus Christ has been filled with the Holy Spirit and he's going to launch his ministry that's going to change the world, literally, and going to usher in the kingdom of God. The Bible says immediately after he's baptized, the the Scriptures give little genealogies, and then in Luke uh, chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Then Jesus being filled with the Holy Spirit. We've been talking about the Holy Spirit for months around here. Being filled with the Holy Spirit, returned from Jordan and was led by the Spirit. So the Holy Spirit is leading him into the wilderness, being tempted for 40 days by the devil, being tested being tried, being tempted by the devil. You know, I always thought to myself, Jesus went to fast and pray. That's not true. He didn't eat, but never says he fasted. He wasn't fasting and seeking the Father. He was not eating. He was being in a battle for 40 days against the devil. It says very clearly there, he was in a battle against the devil. Well, folks, the world has always been in a battle against the devil, but there are levels and times when the devil gets a foothold an open door in the world due to actions of human beings, due to decisions people make, due to decisions government makes, uh, causes wars and all kinds of things to happen, and the devil gets added access uh, into the church, into other areas, and so I'm calling it heightened spiritual warfare. You know, Chuck Smith was uh, the founder of Calvary Chapel, and one of the greatest ministries uh, in my lifetime and uh, he had a little church called Calvary Chapel down in Orange County during the Jesus uh, uh, hippie movement or the hippie movement, and then later the what was called the Jesus People Revival. He had a small church, small group of people. But as he opened his doors and hippies began to get saved, all of a sudden they were reaching thousands. Literally, they couldn't you know, keep up. Uh, his autobiography is a great book to read. He couldn't keep up with the thousands of people coming to Calvary Chapel at Costa Mesa. They, they built a bigger building. Then they put a tent up. They built a bigger building. They couldn't keep up. They baptized thousands of people in the oceans uh, week after week. They were on the cover of magazines, Newsweek, Look Magazine, all of that, because the New- Los Angeles Times, everything featured, because this unbelievable thing was happening, and all these people were getting saved. But it came out of a massive disruption. The Vietnam War, uh, the, the, the killings uh, that happened and the murders up at uh, uh, Ohio University, and, and you could go on and on, and then the hippies uh, uh, becoming uh, uh, just cashing out, so to speak, and, and moving off, uh, and then they got disillusioned whenever uh, their people began to become heroin addicts and commit suicide and, and die of overdoses. And here's what Chuck Smith said in his, his little paragraph from his book I've been reading. Rarely, he said, rarely. Has there been a time in history when a culture had reached a critical mass in which it was so perfectly prepared to discover the person and teaching of Jesus Christ? The Christian church, which from its founding was an outpost of the margin of society, provided the ideal environment for hippies to be reconciled to God and re-enter the mainstream culture without letting go of their beliefs that peace and love should prevail the world. Once they heard the message and found a church whose doors were open to them, they came flooding in by the hundreds and by the thousands. So here's the picture. All the things that had been happening in America you know, all that had been happening with the, G, the hippies, and, and you had to be alive then to understand how you think we had a wild time now. That was a wild time, amen. I was living on Sunset Boulevard in 1969 going to college, and uh, right in the height of that thing. And I'll tell you, it was a wild time. But, uh, hundreds of thousands lined up and down the streets, smoking dope and everything right on the streets, living on the, more living on the streets then or living on, than living on the streets now, amen, <laughs> during that time in, in Hollywood and such. And he said, it was, it, what he's saying here is there was a ripe time. God was about to do something in the earth. Nobody thought there was any hope for hippies, and that next generation was just going to uh, uh, blow their mind with drugs, and that was going to be it. Uh, and yet the greatest revival uh, since 19, early 1900s happened in that generation of young people. 
who are now my age. <laughs> Amen. And, uh, and so what I'm talking about, it was a time of heightened spiritual warfare. It was a time when the enemy was trying to destroy a generation, trying to destroy them, and, and he was doing a very good job of destroying a young generation back in the 60s and early 70s. But he said it was a time that God set up, and when the right time came, things shifted, and they began to get saved by the thousands. And most churches today, contemporary worship with bands and such as that, uh, uh, and most churches today have had came out or were influenced by or touched by the Jesus People Revival. I'm reading the life story or the, the book by Barack Obama, our president before, and he writes a book called The Promised Land. And he says these words. He was a young senator. Two years is all he had been a senator. Young man, and he had no experience beyond that, except a little time in Chicago, in, in the Illinois Senate. And so when he got in there, he was so popular because he was the only black man in the Senate. The first black man in the American Senate was Barack Obama. He was the only one in the Senate at that time. Some others maybe had been there, but he was the only one at that time. And he became so popular, it was a groundswell that nobody understood. He had, he had no money. He was broke, literally. They were in debt. And all these things, when he became a senator to, to, be, to get in there, to, took everything they had, and his wife did not want to be in politics at all. And, he, uh, and the groundswell was so big, people were telling him, you need to run for president even though you're just a two-year senator. We all know about that story. But here's what he, he went to see Ted Kennedy. Ted Kennedy uh, was the senior man in the, in, in the Senate. Kennedy's, and he had the legacy of the Kennedy family and the Kennedy name. So he, had the most, he was the most powerful man in the Senate. And, and he went to see him to get his opinion. And Kennedy said these words to him, the power to inspire is rare. Moments like these are rare. You think you may not be ready, but you'll do, you'll do it as a, and you think you may not be ready and that you'll do it at a more convenient time. But you don't choose the time. The time chooses you. Either you seize what may turn out to be the only chance you have, or you decide you're willing to live with the knowledge that the chance has passed you by. How many people in life, the chance has passed them by? Opportunity came, and here he was. He, had no, he didn't have the money. He didn't have anything. But uh, he became the next president of the United States for the next eight years. I'm not uh, saying he was what, anything about his presidency. I'm just saying it was an uh, unbelievable thing that happened at the right time, the right man, at the right place, uh, and he became president of the United States. Because something was happening in our culture at that time and in his life and such as that. Well, we're living in such a time as that. And in this type of a time when God is wanting to do and is going to, in spite of anybody or anything, a new thing, then there's going to be this heightened spiritual warfare. So here's Jesus. God's about to usher in uh, the new covenant, going to change the world, bring in the church of Jesus Christ in the earth. I mean, nothing more historic than Jesus Christ coming to this earth, dying on the cross and rising from the dead. And so as he's starting his ministry, the demon powers, the devil himself begins to fight him for 40 days. They fight and do battle and is tested in the wilderness. So then it says in Luke 4, 1, Jesus being filled with the Spirit, or Luke 4, 14, it says, then Jesus returned in the power of of the Spirit into Galilee. So he went up to that mountain filled with the Holy Spirit. He came down from that wilderness place in the power of the Holy Spirit. Two different words. One was filled, one was in power. Going through that 40 days of testing with the devil did something in Jesus Christ that made him come out of that mountain with power. And the power to now launch his ministry, the power to begin to heal the sick, raise the dead, preach the gospel, feed the hungry, steal the calms, and, uh, and show himself as the Son of God. Hallelujah. So when you realize there was a heightened spiritual warfare, when Jesus came to the earth, more demon activity began to happen. Everywhere he went, he would cast out demons out of people because demons were manifesting. All kinds of things were happening because Jesus Christ was in the world and he was going to do something new in the earth. So, folks, what I'm saying is there is real spiritual warfare. And it gets played out uh, 
are manifested in the natural realm. And the Bible says we don't wrestle, and I'm going to read that in just a moment, but it gets played out in your life. It gets played out in your family. It gets played out in our government. It gets played out on a global scale. And we've seen that happen with this pandemic, with all this about it. One of the goals was to shut the church down. The devil's always wanted to shut the church down. One of the greatest experiences of my life, I have told it many times here, was in China back in 1986, I think it was, with John McGovern. When we went in to see one of the leaders of the underground church, and they had to sneak us in by night. We had, and we're in China now, folks. It's not safe anyways at that time. And uh, they sneak us in one at a time at night into this man's house so nobody can know these Americans are coming because if they saw Americans there, they would arrest him again. He'd already spent 20 years in prison for preaching the gospel. And then and going into that kind of atmosphere, uh, the underground church and the, the pressure they were under and the situ- situations they were facing was an amazing experience uh, of spiritual warfare and how it plays out uh, in common life like you and I. So God, Paul the Apostle wrote in Ephesians 6, listen to this, verse 10. He says, finally, he's written this book of Ephesians, powerful book, and he's coming to the end. He says, finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. If there's any word you need to circle, write down, and you need to uh, put into your heart, it's be strong in the Lord. Because if you don't come to grips with the fact that there is a devil and he's out to kill, steal, and to destroy you, your family, your life, your finances, your country, the church, whatever it is, and you think it's just uh, when life is normal, then you're going to miss out because it's not life is normal anymore. It's not life is normal anymore. It's not going to be life as normal. Amen. Whatever COVID, whatever happens to the virus, doesn't matter. There will be another virus. There will be another this, another that. Because uh, things have shifted in the spirit realm, folks. And the church, uh, the church of Jesus Christ is the one that needs to understand this. And if we don't understand this, folks, uh, we'll be washed away just like the rest of the folks in what is going to happen and what is happening in our world. So he says, finally, my brother, and be strong in the Lord. Not in your own strength, not in your intellect, not in your government, not in all the things you can come up with to solve your problems. He said it's the enemies against you. Here's what he says. In the Lord and the power, there's that word power, same word that they use when Jesus came out of the wilderness in the power of the Holy Ghost. God says, I've given my church power. Did you know that? Power. But we don't, we don't uh, use that power. We try to do everything in our own strength, ability, programs, and such things as that. I give you power, he said. And if we don't tap into that power, which we have the ability to do through prayer, faithfulness, holiness, and such as that, then we'll miss out. folks. And so he says, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God. See the word put on? Put on. That's not something that's done for you. It's not something that, uh, that you don't have to do anything about. You, someone didn't dress you this morning, I don't think. You probably dressed yourself. You probably put on your own dress or your own pants. Hallelujah. I hope you did. And, uh, and uh, the Bible says you put it on. Don't wait for the, someone else to come and get you all dressed up. Don't wait for the preacher to get you dressed up. You put on the whole armor of God. That means uh, I have to get in the Word of God. I've got to get serious with God uh, because if I'm uh, the devil's serious and if I'm not serious, uh, amen, he will uh, pull his tricks. Now, I want to move on because i got a lot to give you. Now, I have two of these sermons that I've preached in the last couple of weeks on my webpage, LarryNeville.com. I encourage you to listen to these two sermons that are along this line because the Holy Spirit is speaking to us about this, and we're going to move into a new series that we're going to call Truth and Error starting next Sunday, Truth and Error, and we're going to cover a lot of things today that have to do with that. But I want to finish this. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles or the strategies, the plans of the devil. So the devil has strategies against you. Did you hear me? Strategies against you. And he's working them every day on you. He's working them through your pocket right now. If you have a phone in your pocket, he's got a strategy right there to tempt you and test you. When you turn it on, he's got strategies through your friends, friends that are saved, friends at work, people at work. He's got a strategy that he's been working, and we'll see that in just a minute. And if you don't take it serious, you'll get yourself find out he does kill. He does steal. 
He does destroy. He's been doing it ever since the beginning of time, and he knows how to do it today, and we see it happening. I can name people in the last months that I've talked to that are being killed and destroyed by the devil because the church of Jesus Christ in America is not prepared for any level of spiritual warfare. We're a bunch of wimps. We're a bunch of, we get a, if we get a flat tire on Sunday morning in an air-conditioned garage, we think the devil's fighting us. We think, oh, it's any little, oh, my car broke down. The devil's been fighting. That ain't fight the devil fighting you, folks. That's you just need a new tires. Ain't nothing to do with the devil. You need a car with a good car. Don't blame him for breaking down on the highway. Amen. But when the devil fights, you know it. The mind gets all messed up. People do stupid things. Uh, they, they torment comes. They, people do uh, unbelievable things, immoral things that they wouldn't normally do. All kinds of things happen when you are assaulted with heightened spiritual warfare if you're not ready. And we've proven that the American church, or this year has proven, is not ready because we usually preach joy juice, prosperity, and blessing we hear all the time. So often we hear all this stuff, many places, and it's just about how God's going to bless you, keep you in peace, and all that. And it has that element to it, but that's not all there is. There's a devil. So he tells us that you can stand against the wiles, the strategies of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. See, that's what he says right there. What you're going through is not just a chemical imbalance. What you go through and what people go through is not just a a bad decision. It's not just people coming around you. It's all strategies to kill, steal, and to destroy the destiny of God. And so here uh, it says, against the strategies of the devil, for we don't wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities. Look at that. And powers against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Wow. That's what the church of Jesus Christ is about, folks. It's not a club, it's not a social gathering. It's not a place that we just come and have fun and enjoy ourselves. It is a place where we're doing spiritual warfare against principalities and powers. We are a spiritual entity in an earthly setting. We're a a colony of heaven. We're citizens of heaven down here is what we are. When you were born again, your name's written in God's uh, census bureau up there, in his Lamb's book of life, and we are people of God, and there is a spiritual dimension to everything that happens in the church of Jesus Christ and in our lives. He says, so we're fighting against these rulers of darkness. That's talking about the demonic forces that are an army, uh, rulers, uh, they have authority, they have principalities and powers, uh, and uh, uh, the darkness of this age, this time, uh, before Jesus comes back to the earth and sets up his kingdom, that's what we're doing. We're wrestling against these, uh, and he says, uh, uh, against spiritual host of wickedness in heavenly places. Therefore, he says, since you understand that, since you know that, since you're feeling that, He says, then take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. In the evil day. Jesus talked about how the days will become more evil before he returns to this earth at some point. It will be a progressive thing that will continue to happen. And so he says that you can stand in the evil day and having done all to resist or to stand, stand therefore. That's pretty good, isn't it, huh? That's some pretty good writing. Don't you say amen? He said, after you've done all to stand, don't just flake out and give up. Oh, poor me. I've been trying and trying and trying, and I just can't get the victory. Oh, you can't be that. It's after you've done all to stand, after you've done all to do right, after you've done all to pray, after you've done all, then stand anyways, he said. Hallelujah. We got some Christians need to take a stand. Take a stand in your life, a stand in your heart for God. And so he says, stand therefore. Then he begins to talk about the spiritual armor that you put on. We'll deal with later. Having put on your waist, here's the one I want. Having put on or girded your waist or put on a belt of your waist with truth. The battle is over truth. In the book of Genesis, folks, the first battle was a lie. The serpent said to Eve, did God really say you can eat of all the fruit? He planted a lie in her heart, and lies have been planted ever since. Jesus Christ himself said, the devil is the father of lies. And anyone that has any sense 
of any equilibrium in their life can look at our world in America and know that our world is truly crazy. Two weeks ago, and probably more than that, but I was reading the news, and they said that this guy who says he's a girl walked into a locker room with a bunch of women and little girls and said, I'm a woman, so he started taking off his clothes. And then they began to scream and run out of there, and the news says, why, this woman began to take off her clothes, and she had men's genitals. Now, how can that be? I'm not trying to mock it, uh, really mock them. I just say, how can that be? The poor persons, the poor idiots in the news. She, it said, S H E, had men's genitals. It didn't say he did, he said she did, indicating that they, they are as messed up as everybody else in our world. And so, number one, I want to leave with you there's a real personal spiritual enemy that's striving against you. That song we sang said there's no striving if you're in the Lord. Well, you rest in the Lord, but you still got to strive if you're going to have victory. Amen. And there's a certain truth to that. And uh, we, we do need Jesus. The Bible tells us that Jesus sent out the disciples. The first time they went to preach, the very first time, he sent out 70 of them to preach. And it says when they came back, they were all excited. They said, man, even demons are subject to us. All this began, they saw demons manifested, all that. And Jesus said these words in Luke 10, 18, I saw Satan. I saw Satan. We're not, we're not talking about something, folks, that's not real. You felt it in your life in various levels, but I'm telling you, it's getting heightened in people's lives. I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Jesus said that. Imagine, like lightning from heaven fall to the earth. And that's when he said in John 10, 10, the thief does not come except only, his only reason to come is to kill, steal, and to destroy. Amen. The thief, the thief, there's that word, the devil, Satan, Lucifer, the serpent, whatever you want to call him. He came to kill viruses, sicknesses, disease, wars, all these types of things that bring hatred when it shouldn't be there, race divisions, all these things, to steal from you all God has for you, all God wants for your destiny in God, your purpose in God. He wants to steal that, make you fall into immorality, make you mess up your life, all kinds of things happen, to steal from you what God has for you because Jesus said, I came to give you abundant life. And so that's the first thing. We have a real enemy. He's the devil. Number two, he has weapons. The devil uses weapons. There's real weapons. It tells us in Ephesians 6, 11, put on the armor of God that you might be able to stand against the strategies. The, the, and you'd say weapons, the, the, the uh, works of the devil. And then in 2 Corinthians 2, 11, it says this. In or, he's just talking about the same thing. In order that Satan might not outwit us, for we are not unaware of his schemes. He said, Christians, it will, and he's talking about having your mind to Christ and praying and doing things like that. He said, you need to do that because so the devil won't outsmart you. It's not hard to outsmart us, folks. We're not the smartest people in the world. And even the smartest people seem to be the ones who get outsmarted the most sometimes. Isn't that right? By the devil. And uh, the devil forms, that's what he means, schemes and strategies against the church. Against us. You hear people talking bad about the church, talking smack about the church, and bad things happening in the church. Bad things do happen in the church because a bunch of people are there. There's no perfect church. Why? Right? Because we're here, right? It's not perfect. We understand that. But nevertheless, God still loves his church, and he still loves us. And the devil has these plans and schemes, strategies against the church. In Isaiah chapter 54, 17, he says, no weapon formed against you. Talking about Israel, but uh, also us as the church. No weapon formed against you shall prosper. That word formed means designed. No weapon. That means the devil designs weapons right against you. He says, Ralph, I got a weapon I'm going to use against you. <laughs> He says, every one of us, I've got a weapon. I've been forming it all your life. I've been working this weapon, and it means that just for you, one size doesn't fit all. So he brings the, these uh, 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 
this arsenal of weapons, it's not aimless, it's tailored against the seasons we live in, the times we live in. He has weapons right now he's fighting. The three main areas that are suffering in spiritual warfare that I, that I recognize as personal. People are going through battles personally in various ways. Maybe you're not, but a lot of people are. People are going, and uh, they're going through battles. That's one area that he's fighting. The church, Jesus said, I'll build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That talks about a battle against the church. And he's fighting against families to destroy families like he never has before. And he's using every method, like the one I just mentioned a moment ago about that guy and everything that's happening in our culture that's tearing down the family, coming against the family. That is all satanic inspired, nothing to do with human nature. It's all satanic inspired. And so why do I say this? He said, no weapon formed. They are formed for the season, formed for the hour. Amen. These cell phones are wonderful tools, but they can become the worst tool in your hand if you want to be a righteous person. They'll be the worst thing you can use. And, and we can name dozens of other things. The TV is a wonderful thing to have. But when you turn it on, you open your home up to cursing. You open it up many times to immoral acts. You open your home up to all kinds of things that don't go on in your house. And you sit there and watch it and laugh at it. And we think nothing's happening in our lives. The enemy is using everything. Why is Hollywood so corrupt? Why is so much immorality and all that in Hollywood? Because its idea is to soak it into us. Or the cartoons, everything is getting infiltrated. He's using every tool that's at man's disposal to heighten spiritual warfare against you, your family, and the church and the message of truth. Truth, he says, is what you got to hold on to. Whew. Are you following me? You're awful quiet out there. Hallelujah. Ephesians 4.27, don't give a foothold to the devil. Don't even let him... Stick his foot in your door. Don't let him in there. How do you do that? Well, we're going to cover that in this next series, but don't let him even get in there. Don't play with him. Don't even, don't even give it an avenue because if you do, he won't mess around. He'll kick the door down. That's what it's talking about. Don't give a foothold to the devil, an opportunity. Ephesians 5.18, don't get drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Instead, be filled with the Spirit. Why would he say that? Why would he write that to that Ephesian church? Don't get drunk. Don't, don't go playing around, he said. You're in a serious time. Don't go just uh, playing around and thinking, oh, it's okay. I can play on Saturday night and come to church and sing worship on Sunday morning. He said, don't think you can do that. It's not going to work. He says, don't, uh, he says, don't get drunk with wine because that will ruin your life. Be filled. Be filled. Be filled with the Spirit of God. Hallelujah. Matthew. Uh, well, Ephesians 5.11, have nothing to do, he says, have nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness, rather expose them. Have nothing to do with them. Man, what does that mean to you? What does that mean to the people watching today? Have no nothing to do with the fruitless deeds of darkness. Don't enjoy them. Don't participate in them. Hallelujah. Figure out what standards you're going to have and where the line gets drawn in, in being a man or a woman of God. Matthew 12 or 11, 12, from the days of John the Baptist, until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violent have taken it by force. That means from the moment John the Baptist started preaching just before Jesus, the forerunner of Jesus, all hell broke out. And uh, he says violence because he was ushering in the kingdom with Jesus. Finally, John had his head cut. His head was cut off. Jesus was crucified. All the disciples but one was mar martyred for their faith. Isn't that violence? Every kind of violence came against the church you can imagine, and it continues to this day. We're just in a situation where we've enjoyed the most freedom of any people in the whole world. And it's a wonderful thing we have. But we're being bombarded on every level and attacked by every level, social media in every ways, we're cutting loose to attack the church and the message of truth. So here's the third thing I want to leave with you. The war is over truth. I've said it already, but that's where the war is. It's not over you or me. It's not over Praise Chapel. It's over truth. Anybody that will stand or preach for truth of the Word of God. I'm not talking about their opinion on politi politics and stuff like that. Truth of the Word of God. Amen. Genesis 3.11, I said it a moment ago, the serpent was the shrewdest of all the wild animals the Lord God made. One day he asked the woman, did God really say? He lied. He planted a lie. And that's what he's been doing ever, ever since. The stuff you're reading, young people, the stuff you're getting in school, a lot of stuff about, about uh, culture, 
about uh, uh, sexuality and all that stuff. It's just a lie. And it's just and anybody that would look at a human body can know it's a lie. And understand we're dealing with lies everywhere we turn. That's why the truth is so critical to get into your heart. Amen. In 1 Timothy 3.15, I write to you so you may know how you ought to behave yourself or conduct yourself in the house of God. This is the house of God. The church is the house of God, which is the church, he says right there, of the living God, the church of the living God. Folks, there's nothing more precious than church. The church of Jesus Christ. He said, I will build my church. Here we are 2,000 years later, and the church is growing all over the world. I will build my church, and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. And so, again, we see that principle right there. Uh, and uh, against it. He, uh, here, he said, the church, the house of God, house of the, which is the house, church of the living God, excuse me, the pillar, the ground of the truth. There's only one place that truth really is. It's in the Word of God. The Bible is... For every generation, no generation changed. David, David fell into uh, for, uh, immorality with Bathsheba, had a child and killed the dad, and the same stuff happens today. It's no different. People have fallen for the same stuff every generation. Money, uh, sex, violence, various things as that. They've fallen for the same stuff. It never changes. That's why the Bible's relevant to every generation and every type of culture because the same sins are sins. It doesn't change. And so he says the church is the pillar of truth. All right, Proverbs 14, 12, listen to this. There is a way that seems right to a man or to people. This is the right way, says the, the dominant culture. This is the right way, says the popular culture. This is the right way, but then what does God say? But it ends, its end is the way of death. Wages of sin is what? Death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ. Sin feels good, the Bible says, for a season. It says that. You, it's enjoyable for a season. But it, down the road, it pays its wages in one way or another. Matthew 15, 14 says this, Jesus referring to people that were against the truth, blind leaders of the blind. And if the blind lead the blind, they all fall in a ditch. Pretty practical, huh? Follow the blind and you'll fall in a ditch. Just take it for granted. Let your kids study what they want. Take for granted whatever they're, whatever they're playing on a video game, whatever this stuff. Let the blind leave the blind. They're all going to end up in the same hole together is what Jesus Christ said. So you don't go to TikTok for truth. Well, there might be a few guys preaching on there, but you don't go there for truth or, or Instagram or YouTube or Fox or CNN or any of them because they're not going to give you the, the truth of the Word of God. The church is the pillar and the ground of the truth. The challenge that we face is that the world doesn't want truth. It wants fantasy. We want to believe fantasy. We want to believe what we want to believe. Can you say amen? So we want to, people just want to live their life and do their thing, and who cares? You know, it's going to all work out. Yeah, we know God's going to work things out in, in his time, but he says, you know, the, the, you know, the truth, is they want fantasy, and they never, the world never wants the truth, never has, never wanted the truth, and does not want the truth today. It has more a clout now than it ever had. Okay, and our job as Christians is to present the truth to the dying world until Jesus Christ comes back to this earth again and he takes the church out. That's the job of the church. Hallelujah. Isaiah chapter 5, verse 20 says this, Beware of those who call evil good and good evil. Beware of people that call evil good. And good evil, because it's just, it's, it's just crazy. And the further the world, listen to me, folks, the further the world and the culture moves away from God, and it is, the wiser they think they become, but the more crazy they become. And that's throughout history. Read Romans chapter 1. I had it in my notes, but I don't have time. Romans chapter 1, and you'll see what it says. Uh, and you'll see what he's saying there, that they became just nuts with knowledge the further they were away from God. So number four, it says, that, and I want to leave this with you, the challenge is to stand strong on the promises of God. To be, understand what is happening, heighten spiritual warfare. He's, he's putting up the fire higher because God's about to do something in the earth on a global scale. I'm not prophesying. I'm just telling you it's the history of the church. 
when you face things like we faced in this last year and we're going to face the next few years, then, then you'll understand that there's a heightened level of spiritual warfare, just like it was during that time that Chuck Smith said there's a season. It was the ripest time, and he saw the, the nations, the world saw people get saved by massive amounts, okay? And so standing on Ephesians 3.10, finally, brother, and be strong. So stand on the promises of God. Know the Word. Get into the Word. We'll be talking about that more. It's us that have to do it, folks. And be strong. And the last thing I want to leave with you is Jesus promised us power over all the powers of the enemy. There is no place for defeat for the church. You don't have to be kicked by the devil and knocked down by the devil. We can stumble. I'm not saying any of us are perfect. The Bible says all of us have sinned. Third John says if we sin, talking to the Christians, if we sin, we have an advocate with the Father that if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us all unrighteousness and his blood to wash us clean. We know that. We know that. We know, and there wasn't a person in the Bible that the Bible used except Jesus Christ. That did, the Bible didn't show us some of their flaws, right? But none of them were perfect. Even Peter, uh, you know, Jesus said, I'm, you're, you're going to fall, Peter, but I'm praying for you when you come back that you'll strengthen the brother. He knew he would fall. People do that. But you don't have to. There's power and promises to you. For your family, there's promises. For yourself, there's promises. For your finances, there's promises. In the midst of the worst of times, you can walk in blessing and God. In the midst of heightened spiritual warfare, you can walk in the greatest victory. He says we're more than conquerors, more than conquerors through Christ. You and I are. That's what he tells us. We are more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. And he, uh, but that just doesn't happen automatically. That's when we claim the promises, speak them, and bring them into context into our own life experience. See, truth is made manifest through the church. And so we get the truth whenever we receive from the Holy Spirit. We're full of the Holy Spirit, but then in context with other Christians. If you're a person that doesn't hang around with Christians, don't get around anybody, you don't come to church very often, then there's something missing, that part of the dimension that you need of the truth. Because he said, he put the truth, Jesus said, I will build my assembly. He put it together. We didn't. God ordained that. Jesus ordained the church. He could have done it another way, but he did one that said, I'm going to build it. And so he says in Luke 10, verse 17, these guys came back from casting out devils, and they were excited because the demons were subject to them. And what did Jesus say? He said, the 70 returned with joy, saying, Lord, even the demons are subject to us in your name. He said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. So he let them know, this is real. Behold, I give you authority. Say authority. authority. Say it like you mean it. Authority. authority. Tell your neighbor, you have authority. You have it. I give you authority in the name of Jesus Christ to trample, to trample. Ha! The devil was defeated on the cross of Calvary, folks. Amen. To trample on serpents and scorpions and over all the power, the strategies, the works of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. He's talking to the people that are going to be crucified for him, the people that are going to go to prison for him, the people that are most of them are going to die martyrs' death for him. So he's not saying that they're not going to face things, that they're not going to face problems, but even in their death they were conquerors. Even when they crucified them, they were conquerors. Even when they hung them and burned them at the stake, they were conquerors because the gospel went on and they might have been killed, but they won anyways. Are you following me? He said, you're more. We're going to conquer. Conquer. We do conquer in Jesus' name. But they would face those things because they, because they stood for truth. Jesus said, you shall know the truth, and the truth will set you free. Everything about the church is supernatural. I mean, we're all carnal, and we have our carnal stuff, but there is a supernatural emphasis on the church. And I'm sure that... Uh, Greg and Nancy, they were here long before I ever came to this church. Uh, and way back when it was, in, what, six people in a house or something? Just your family and a few others. And they've watched this, been a part of it in and out, and they're still a part of our church. We, we sent them off to help the Ontario Church a number of years ago. And uh, they, they're still a part of this, and, and they've seen it all the years. It's a miracle we're here right now, isn't it? Huh? Don't you, wouldn't you say that? Why? Because God did it, right? We had how many, five, six pastors have pastored this church over the years? Uh, and, uh, and we're still here. Why? Because God says, I'll build my church. And the gates of hell won't prevail. I want you to stand with me. I, I pray that you feel my heart this morning because I have been walking through this uh, 
throughout the pandemic, and I've been walking through this because longer than that, and I can't go into all the details of it, but quite a long time before this, God was dealing with me for our fellowship and, and our ministry around the world. And uh, um, then as this thing began to close and we began to come out, and it looks like, wow, we're coming out of this thing. It's looking good. Then I began to see this, this next wave of people, people going through stuff, families going through stuff, people making decisions that were just even, even key people in our fellowship making decisions uh, that are just crazy. So many things happening. Uh, in, it's just, there's, no, there's, no, there's no logic in some of the things that some have fallen to individually. Because the devil's coming personally against you personally, against the church, and and he's coming against your family. And we're going to talk about that in some preceding messages. But the, years ago, Hudson Taylor wrote this, and I've used it many times here in this church. He wrote these words years ago. Bring up the, the Hudson Taylor words there, if you don't mind, the next slide. Amen. And he said he was a first deep into church, which would have had intense spiritual warfare. And he wrote these words, we are a supernatural people, born again by a supernatural birth, kept by a supernatural power, sustained on supernatural food, taught by a supernatural teacher. We're led by a supernatural captain into the paths of assured victories the words of a missionary that gave his life in the depths of China and has seen millions and millions of people turn to Christ since he started Inland China Missions years and years ago. I'm telling you, folks, that was a time, and it turned, and a time that, that, uh, that for China at that time. And it's a time we're living in now. If we as a little handful of people here, in a sense, will recognize, like Chuck Smith said years ago, the season. Churches all across California, all across California would not let a hippie in their church because they were barefooted, they wore holy jeans, they had long hair, and they were probably sleeping out in the field somewhere. Wouldn't let them in their church. And this guy opened his church up and begged them to come. And they came by the tens of thousands. And Calvary Chapel was birthed. And there's mega churches all over L.A. and all over the world because of that incident there. It was a season of God. In the season of God, there's always those that catch, you might say, the wave, and there's those that ignore it and fade away in the next move of God. Praise Chapel was birthed in such a move in East L.A. Uh, when Latinos were getting saved in the early 70s, late 70s, early 80s, and mid-80s here in California. Victory Outreach was birthed. Praise Chapel was birthed. A lot of other uh, Latino ministries were birthed all across the country in the 80s. And, and if you'll check, most of the guys my age, 60s and 70s, Latino that are saved, usually got saved in the 80s. Amen. Did you get saved in the 80s, Timon? Right? And that you would represent your early guys in Praise Chapel, right? Back quite a long time ago, second generation, but early. And, uh, and that, and, 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 and you go to any church, go to any church and ask that question. If you'll find a Latino man that's a born-again Christian that wasn't generationally a Christian, maybe a Catholic, and ask him, when did you get saved? It would have been in the early 80s, somewhere around there, that he got saved, or mid-80s. Because God was doing something, a wave happened. When my brother moved from Oklahoma to East L.A., he hit a wave, and all of a sudden, hundreds and hundreds of people, thousands of people began to come and get saved off the streets of L.A., and Victory Outreach was birthed, and Praise Chapel was birthed, and all these things began to happen. Because it was a season of hype. Just before that, my brother was going to quit the ministry, going to stop pastoring because he couldn't see any fruit. Ready to quit. Maybe you feel like you're ready to quit. I'm telling you, don't quit. Maybe you say, I'm going to make him a don't. Don't do anything. Stupid. <laughs> Wait on the Lord. Wait on the Lord. See what the Lord says to you. Because we don't know what's over the horizon. But I can see a little bit over the horizon, folks, this morning. In my spirit, I can see over the horizon. Hallelujah. And I see a cloud the size of a man's hand like Elijah's servant saw. There's some rain coming. 
God's going to do a work in the earth, but there's still a level that has to get to that the world's not at yet. Still, our confidence has to be shaken a little bit more in our governments and in our medical field and our technology, thinking they're all going to provide the answer. They're not going to provide the answers, ultimately. Amen. Our, our cancel culture and everything else, thinking that's the answer. None of this is the answer. Only the truth. Only the truth. Oh, God, we worship you. God, we worship you. I know that in this room, there's people been going through stuff. Stuff. In your mind, in your spirit, in your health, in your family, in your job. And, I mean, I can just name it in, uh, in so many ways, personally and in other ways. I know you have. God wants to say to you today, stand. Stand, stand in the power of His might. Don't give in to temptation or test. Go through the 40 days if necessary. The 40 days of Jesus represented the 40 days of years in the wilderness that children were in. Go through the time that God has. Go through the time so you'll come out strengthened. Strengthened through the test. Strengthened through the trial. Hallelujah. The church is going to come out stronger, folks. Stronger than it's ever been in America in a long time. Stronger. People are going to begin to rise up and preach the gospel. People are going to begin to rise up and do things for God and outreach and evangelize. Amen. Spontaneously.